All right, if you're just tuning in, we're still discussing multi-generational businesses and we have Femi Akonde um, in to, to talk to us about this. And we're asking, can we truly build multi-generational businesses in Nigeria? I, I doubt that. <laughs> we have too many cultural problems. So Femi, you were talking about um, outside managers and you know, when I asked about polygamy and all of that, you're talking about outside managers. Maybe you should go ahead with that. Yes, so um, you can bring in outside managers but you have to be sure that their culture is going to match with the family's culture. Mm. Um, so you've had situations before where people have brought in outside managers and they've actually robbed the family and looted the family of his assets. Exactly. And so there's a question of trust. But, uh, but you see, as a family, families evolve. A family may evolve from being a business-oriented family to an investment-oriented family. Mm. When a family becomes an investment-oriented oriented family, then you can say to an external manager, these are the criteria we're giving you. These are the returns we expect. This is the way we do business. It will be very clear. Um, so yes, that would improve the chances. Mm. But what the negative of that is that the children don't get a chance to actually grow in certain ways. Mm. They become, you see, I'm very, wor I'm very worried about the focus on finance. The moment children become focused on the dividend that's going to be paid out at the end of the year, you start to build the likelihood of feuds and problems. Mm. And so it's always a nice idea to have one or two children in the business, learning the ropes right from the cleaning room all the way up to the CEO's office. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So um, I like what you've said about being an investment family from a business family. Now, let's look at it from the concept of um, um, China. In China's families' businesses, it has invo they evolve. While they evolve, um, a lot of catalyzed uh, structures and changes are being put in place and policies also are being put in place by the government. So what role does the government actually play in building multi-generational um, businesses in Nigeria? That's a big, that's a huge one. Um, yeah, <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's standard people. Um, they, I, I, essentially, what a government should do is this: in every economy, you need a certain amount of social mobility to encourage people to take risks. Right? You, people need to break through those wealth ceilings for them to have hope that is possible. So, a government must create opportunity must create um, situations where there is opportunity for people to break through those, not glass ceilings, iron ceilings, and mm. break through. Mm. At the same time, the government needs to create enough stability for wealth to become stable. The problem that we have experienced in Nigeria is a problem of government instability. Um, I grew up in the 60s, and they call that generation the lost Wally Shenka calls it the lost generation. Hmm. That generation witnessed so many military coups that, you know, they were unable to really, like, move forward. Many of them hated the idea of going, joining government because of what happened in government. Most of them went on to become professionals. That's why you don't find many of those, um, of that generation in government today. Then, in the 70s, in the 80s, you had SAP that IMF program mm -hmm. that devalued the whole of the Naira mm -hmm. and exactly. made families impoverished. That was another issue. In the 90s, you had June 12, and all the Wahala that surrounded June 12. In the 2000s, you have the huge mismatch between the, um, the, the legislative, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of salaries and, and, and well-being, and the people. And what, we're, what we have in every single decade is what we call entropy, too much change. When there's too much change, money is difficult to build up generational wealth. So people lose their money to government policies. They just change all of a sudden. Governments need to be more stable. They need to have long-term policies. You know, my father was a civil servant way back in the 60s. And I remember Nigeria in those days, we used to have things like uh, eight-year, five-year development plan, 10-year development plan. Right now, 
a development plan is only as good as the year in which they do they say it's, it's, mm. it's. so there's a lot of instability economic instability social instability and then when you add that to the general global instability that is there anyway and all the technological changes there's just too much change in nigeria for mm. money to become stable that's the problem yeah uti so I totally agree with you. Sustainability is a very, very serious issue, um, particularly from um, our government and our political space. So I'm going to ask a bit of a multifaceted question. So when I think about family businesses, I think about three key areas. I think about the family um, and succession. I think about the entrepreneur themselves and whether they actually are creating a family business. And then I think about governance within the organization as well. Now, first of all, my first question is, are all businesses or should every business aim to become a family business? Should it aim to be multi-generational? That's my first question. And then secondly, from the point of governance, because we've just talked about sustainability and all the issues um, of stability within our region, where we can see a change in government policy can literally wipe out a company overnight. What can companies do in terms of governance internally, their processes and procedures that can actually help them stand the test of time? Okay. I think I have a question for you. Can I get you <laughs> out? Of, can you start working for us? <laughs> Those are really good questions, um, really good questions. I think the first um, thing is, should every family continue as a business family? I think that businesses are great in the sense that they create a conversation that families can, you know, come around to. You always need a center to keep people coming. When the patriarch goes, the family does tend to disintegrate a little bit and people go in their different directions. Mm -hmm. So having a business is always a good idea, but it doesn't have to be a business, it could be a philanthropy, but you need some kind of conversation that builds the family together. Having said that, of course, if there are no, um, um, there are no qualified um, family members or interested family members, the family could become a purely investment family, whereby it puts its money, gives its money out to professional managers sets um, benchmarks for it and then you know takes its returns and tries to grow in that way mm -hmm. so a family could easily stop owning a business although the advantages of the business of course is is in terms of maintaining the family story of where did we come from and how did we get here um there's there's a, a brewing company in canada which has kept the old building they started in it's really old and it's kind of run down by the docks. Um, it's a straw family where they've lost some of their money. But they, the thing is that when you walk into that building and you see the age of the old bear casks, you see the old machinery, there's a story you can tell the children of, we weren't always living on Fifth Avenue. We weren't always living you know, in, in, in the best condos in California. We started out from these docks and this is where we built our story from. So, to that extent, a business is good. But if there are no qualified people, oh, I'm all for it. Let the family become an investment family. Hmm. Um, as to the second question, what can a family do to stand the test of time? Um, yes, a family is faced with tremendous entropic forces that are trying to destroy it, whether it's the economy, whether it's social change, whether it is your child falling in love with a, a you know, a really bad gold digger who's you know <laughs> handsome and you know handsome or, or beautiful you know those are all systematic issues mm. but i think that the the main thing is to teach children to be enterprising to land on their feet mm. to be creative um i think the children or whoever is going to run the business needs that innovation in every generation because there are going to be challenges all the time we spoke about the 60s we spoke about the 70s in the 70s you know maybe people should have been putting their money in gold and not fighting their wives who are trying to buy gold you know 24 or whatever cara you know, should put in their money in something stable so you need innovation in every generation you need the children to be highly enterprising you need a system that produces that kind of child. In fact, that kind of family. 
you need an enterprising family. If you have an enterprising family, such a family will be able to manage the risks. But if you have a family that they just come together to share money, hmm. when is the next distribution meeting? Hmm. How much are they sharing? Hmm. Then you have a problem. Wow. Okay, so for me, okay, before I go on, let me take some comments on um, WhatsApp. Nasiru says, do we have 100 years old companies? That's a question. Then Adetola says, we have a lot of big businesses in Nigeria with key person risk. When the key person is no more, how long can that business survive? You know, that's like, you know, the one man company is a giant company, but is a one man um, company. I was going to ask a question because COVID-19 happened. You said with every decade comes its own, its own demons, I'll put in quotes, you yeah. know. 2020, this decade, I mean, COVID-19 has come, it's, you know, it is in our faces, a lot of business uncertainties, you know, it is crazy how businesses that were thriving so well, all of a sudden, it seems like nothing is happening and all of that. So if you were to advise businesses, you know, right now, what would you say they should start putting in place if at all the business would survive this, you know, this, um, this decade? The first thing is you have to start preparing your hair from the moment you start the business. Hmm. You know, one of the things that um, I tell my clients is that don't aim your life at your children. Aim your life at your grandchildren. Wow. You know, wow. Yeah, aim your life, direct all your purposes and your plans towards your grandchildren, even if they haven't been born yet, and teach your children to do the same. So that you have an, at every generation, you have an empowering generation that is ready to step off the stage. One of the problems that we have in many companies is that people delay stepping off the stage. They have a distrust of their children or of their heads. They don't believe that they have what it takes. And so they create fictional jobs for them, feel good jobs with a nice glass test that doesn't mean anything. So from day one, you have to be ready to leave. And when you leave, don't coach from the bench. When you leave, leave and become an ambassador of the company. That's the thing that we need to, you know, we have a very patrician element where, you know, uh, he's my boy, you know, he's my son, he doesn't know anything, I'm always there to help him. No, you have to train him so that you can go. Because you will not be able to manage the challenges that will happen in the next era. So you have to go. Regarding um, whether um, we have any businesses that are 100 years old, I think the closest we do, I mean, I, I'm really trying to do a study of this now, but if you look at, for instance, the Dan Tata, mm. the Dan Tata family, yeah. and you look at the history of that business, that is a business that probably goes back to sometime in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. That is probably a huge business. And, you know, out of that Dan Tata family has now come the Dan Gute, the whole Dan Gute yes. group, yeah. So there is something, it is happening. And there are families also that have had money for a long time. They don't have as much money as they used to, maybe because there are a lot of wives and there are a lot of children, but they still have what it takes. So essentially, just to add this point, it's very difficult to actually lose your money forever mm. if you know what you're doing. Because the way money operates, money is like, if I look at physics, it has states. So first it has the energy state where you can see it, it's tangible. And then it changes shape. All you need to do is to understand what is the shape of my family's wealth and how do we monetize it? Mm -hmm. What is the shape? What is the shape? Where is our wealth? Maybe we're all writing books and we're not making money, but we're writing books, we're teachers, we're educationists and whatever. How do we get those skills together to recover something that we have lost? That's just to comfort anybody whose parents have lost money. All right? You will, there's a way you can get it back. So yes, there are 100 year old businesses. The Dantata family is one. And to summarize, if you want your business to last, prepare for day one to leave the scene. And when you leave, leave. <laughs> so, um, it is also said that um, in our generation today, the millennials, we're told that we are supposed to work hard. 
and work smart. So can you tell us the difference between working very hard and working smart at the same time? No, can because you know why I'm even going to say what I, I will add. Can I add to your question okay, a bit? Because hmm, you, you've not really hit the nail. COVID-19 has hmm. taught everybody that come, you don't need physical structures. You don't need all those big, big things that we thought we needed for mm -hmm. businesses to thrive. All of a sudden, a lot of businesses are moving to the digital space, right? So if you are maybe the core uh, brick and mortar kind of business, mm. that, that is your core, how would you be able to transcend this or transcend Sense. this, uh, what's it called, this decade, if you are not able to move to that level? Because you're talking about smart work, hard work, and all of that. Yes. Um, so, mm. so, yes, so traditionally work has changed. You know, start, yeah. first we started with agricultural farming. You know, agricultural families, you know, you're, you're really lucky. All of you ladies are lucky you were not born in that era because, you know, the thing was to have lots of children because the children were the actual labor, initial laborers and the assets. So we moved from agricultural families, which are very large, then we moved to industrial families mm. where everything was based on a process, you went to work and everything. And a lot of businesses in Nigeria are still running as industrial businesses. Yeah. That's why they tell you, come to work at eight, even if you don't have anything to do. We're still running like industrial businesses. But then we've moved into kind of the knowledge economy. All right, we look into the knowledge economy and people are doing a lot of coaching and a lot of teaching. Yeah. They're trying to set up businesses that are very light, um, businesses that are dealing with logistics, that are dealing with intermediaries and so on. The next stage, of course, is that we're going to move to what we call wisdom, wisdom era, where people don't want to know how you solve their problem, just solve it. Just solve it. Mm. They don't want to know how you worked it out, just solve it. Mm. You know, so businesses, for instance, the consulting businesses like um, Accenture, um, which where I used to work, with one of the, the I used to work there with Accenture, I used to work with Anderson, are leaving the country because they're too expensive. They have a very heavy process. Mm. Now you have two guys sitting in a room with a few apps, a bit of smarts, and they can put together those solutions at a fraction of the cost. Yes. Mm. So definitely we're going into a new era as far as technology is concerned. However, we need to understand that within the Nigerian market, our numbers are an illusion. Mm. We do have 200 million people, but how many of them are on the internet? Mm. We do have 200 million people, but what is their purchasing power? Power. So when you want to move into the internet, be careful that when you're moving in technology, anybody's going to follow you. Hmm. They may not follow you because the market isn't there. Yeah. Wow. So you still need to keep your hand in the brick and mortar business to hmm. service the large population yeah. that has not yet transited to the knowledge of to the tech world wow okay so uti we have one minute left oh my goodness oh we are having fun we always run out of time uti, okay. quickly. so i try to keep it i try to keep it very short now don't ask I the question just conclude business. for us <laughs> when i think family business i think of the ultimate family business and i'm glad that you said it doesn't always have to be corporate it can be philanthropy mm. and for me i think about the british royal family that's mm -hmm. a family business if ever I saw one. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, given everything that is happening now, because this actually just dropped into my mind when you started talking about sowing the seed into the grandchildren rather than the children. Now, if we take a look at what's happening within the grandchildren in that family now, um, we've touched a lot about family and talked about sustainability. I would like to, to, to know if there are any signs or any things that, families can start to pick up on very early on whether or not um, these children could be a good fit in terms of succession early. So like you said, don't just drop the, the black sheep there. Um, are there any of those kind of signs? Because I remember reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm sure we all did, and this concept of teaching your children of to invest. Of course, okay. and, and we have that. one minute. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah, so are there any signs that you think that families can really pick up on to help them in the long run in terms of this succession and being able to keep the family business going? Okay, I'm going to answer that very quickly. The, to, to know who, whether your children can do succession, okay. what, every parent, what every parent needs to do is to look in the mirror. 
because your children were very similar to you. Mm. So we are going to model those children and we have got to make the change ourselves. Yeah. All right. That's the first thing. But I want to give this throw away because of COVID. Families right now, particularly Nigerian fathers and men, you need to have emergency policies in place. You need to get your and write those documents down. You need to put stuff together. We're not praying that anything should happen to you, but really now we all have to have a doomsday formula, a wow. doomsday formula that we can activate immediately if necessary. Hopefully it won't be necessary. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic way to sum it up. Thank you so much, Femi Akande, for joining Thank us this you. evening. And Uti. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Bye. so please, we don't have so much time to talk anything, to, to, to say anything again. But we'll say thank you. Watch the repeat broadcast of this episode tomorrow at 3 p.m. It's been a really, really insightful conversation. You don't want to miss this. And keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms at Show Africa 1 or at Plus TV Africa as we continue to hear what you are saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, here it is again. Every wealthy family had that one member that broke the chain of poverty for future generations. So I hope, you know, <laughs> we find we one that in each member. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll see you live tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Thank you so much, Isi. My pleasure. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>